I'm here at the famous Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, perusing the cars that are not on the museum's exhibit floors, but rather down in the basement known as the vaults. The Peterson Museum is in the fortunate situation to have more cars than they can display at any given time, and the cars that aren't on display are stored in the cool, dry, and safe location in the vault and basement of the museum. Leslie Kendall is the chief curator of the museum, how many cars do you guys actually have here and how many are in the vaults at any given time? Well, the Peterson Museum owns about 400 cars and at any one time there are about 250 down in the subterranean area that we call the vault. Well, that's a great collection of cars and in part one of this series of videos, we showed you about a dozen important and interesting cars. Here in part two, we're going to show you a different dozen important and interesting cars, except that these cars also have famous owners. Now, do you know everything about each and every one of these cars? Well, I know a lot about them. I can't say that I know everything. I'd be surprised if anybody knew everything about their cars. Well, let's take a look and find out what you know. In part one of the vault tour, we saw a 1939 Bugatti 57. Here's another 3957, but this one is bodied by Van Voren. What's special about this car? Well, what a difference coachwork makes. This is a one-of-a-kind car, body by Von Voren, to give as a gift from the French government to the Prince of Persia, the future Shah of Iran, on his wedding in 1939. Wow. What are some of the details on this car that really set it apart? Everything about this car is just absolutely extraordinary. I think the thing that most people notice when they walk up to it is all four wheels are fully skirted. It almost looks like it's gliding. Uh, it doesn't even look, when it's, when it's underway, it doesn't even look like it's touching the street. Uh, you've got headlights that have very interesting grills over them that almost look Middle Eastern in a way. Uh, and you go, you kind of get back farther and it's got a windshield that actually cranks up and down into the cowl by means of a hand crank underneath the dashboard. You go farther back, it's got a top that conceals completely beneath a metal panel. And it looks just as good up as it does down. It's so beautifully contoured. And at the end, you've got a sweeping rear with a nice chrome fin right in the middle of the trunk. Just like all 57s seem to have in one form or another. Fins were an Art Deco flourish in that time, and a lot of uh, expensive luxury car manufacturers um, like to have them on their sports versions. What about these door handles and this thing that looks almost like a bell sticking out of the <laughs> side of the car? Well, what looks like a bell is actually a cowl vent that if you twist it, it admits air to the passenger compartment. And these doors, they're, they're actually very, very streamlined. They're flush with the body. In order to open it, you push in on one side, push down, pops right open. That's really cool. Now, when this car was owned by the Shah of Iran, when did he give it up? Did he give it up when he kind of gave up his throne involuntarily back in late 70s? No, he gave up this car a little bit before that. Um, rumor <laughs> has it that this car was sold out of the Imperial Garage in 1959 for 275 US dollars, the equivalent <sighs> of 275 US dollars. In the 1950s, 275 dollars was about what this car was worth. Keep in mind that in 1959, Cadillac had just come out with big fins, V8s were all the rage, lots and lots of chrome. In the late 50s, there really was nothing older than this car. It was a wild looking Bugatti. They didn't make Bugattis anymore. How were you gonna get parts for them? Uh, they weren't venerable like they are today, but well, this one quickly got a lot of attention. Well, and the whole idea of collecting cars really hadn't gotten started at that point. Uh, the, I mean, today, a lot of people want to collect cars and have yeah. cars like this, but back then, that was just not a hobby that had really taken off. Well, back in the 50s, people were collecting Mercer Raceabouts and, and Stutz Bearcats and things like that. These really hadn't come into their own. They were still a little too modern for people. But then as the years went by, you know, we started to look back and say, man, those Art Deco cars were really pretty cool. We should be collecting those. I, I can't help but look at these enclosed front wheels from a practical standpoint. Can you actually do a U-turn in this car? Or is it pretty tight uh, turn well, restriction? You, you can do a U-turn if you've got a football field to, do, to execute <laughs> it in, but otherwise you're, you're in trouble. You have to make wide sweeping turns. So 
to be a head of state and owning this car actually makes a certain amount of sense. Well, it makes a certain amount of sense. And also, I don't think uh, the Prince of Persia, the future Shah of Iran, was behind the wheel too frequently because how much, how many miles of paved roads were there in Iran in 1939? And Probably many not cars, many. And how many cars did he have? And how many cars? He had plenty of cars, believe me. He had one for each mile in the country, maybe. <laughs> probably, probably. This is a 1941 Cadillac Series 62 Custom. Yep. How is a Series 62 Custom different from a regular Cadillac? Well, the Series 62 was Cadillac's bread and butter lineup. You could get a coupe or a sedan or a convertible. It was a kind of car that an owner would buy to drive himself. So it was the mainstream Cadillac model? You could call it that. You could call it the mainstream Cadillac. What did this have under the hood? Uh, under the hood, this car has a high compression flathead V8. And when it's called a Series 62 Custom, does that mean it has some special bodywork or modifications? Well, this particular one was substantially modified by the dealer that delivered it, which was Hillcrest Cadillac. What's interesting about the modifications is they predicted exactly what the customizers would do after World War II. The car has a raked windshield, it has a padded top, it has blanked in quarter windows, and it has trim that was shaved off the side. All of those things would come to be embraced by the customizing community, especially in Los Angeles. Boy, that seems to be a lot of work for a dealer to do. Modern day dealers wouldn't have the capability of making those kind of changes. Modern day dealers wouldn't, wouldn't have done that, but they might if it was a star like Clark Gable, which is who this car was built for. Was that the time when uh, Gable was with Carol Lombard and other stars as well? That's right, Gable and Carol Lombard were going together when this car was built and he gave it to her. Uh, when she was killed in a very unfortunate plane accident, he couldn't bear to have the car anymore, and he sold it. So how did the museum come to acquire this car? Uh, Mr. Peterson acquired this through a private transaction. Well, it's a lovely car, and it, it sounds like it's a fairly unique part of this collection. It is a unique part. It's unique, and it's important. Uh, I think people will appreciate the fact that it's the only 1941 three-window coupe ever built on a Cadillac. This is a 1952 Chrysler Imperial Parade Phaeton. And that parade kind of gives you an idea of what it's about. It sort of has this big back seat. Uh, what exactly was this car used for? Well, this car was used indeed for parades. Um, this car transported a lot of dignitaries. It transported Eisenhower when he was president. Uh, many, many astronauts in ticker tape parades, you name it. Chrysler actually built three of these. They gave one to the city of New York, they gave one to the city of Los Angeles, and this is the car they wanted to give to the White House. But the White House was prohibited from accepting it because of a no gifts policy. So Chrysler retained it and it became known as the Detroit car and they made it freely available um, to the White House whenever they needed it. Now what did Chrysler do to turn a regular Imperial into one of these things? Well, Chrysler did uh, an awful lot to this car. In addition to extending the wheelbase, they had to rework virtually all of the sheet metal from the cowl back to make the contours uh, run nicely together. Because uh, anytime you extend the wheelbase of a car, you've got to change everything so it, so it looks balanced. Uh, and we think they did a beautiful job. This car actually started out as a 1952, but people looking at it today say, wait a minute, that's not a 52, it looks like a 56. And they're absolutely right, because in 1956, Chrysler took all three of them back, updated them with the Exner forward look styling, and then gave them back to, the, uh, to their respective cities. Now mechanically, was this a pretty stock car otherwise? Mechanically, it's a very stock car, although it does have one major difference, and it's got what they call a parade generator. That's so the battery doesn't run down when it's creeping along at, at two and a half or three miles an hour in a parade. Well, we forget that, that these old cars had generators and not alternators, and generators really didn't charge very well at idle, did they? They did not do as good a job as an alternator does. You're absolutely right. So they had, that was something they really had to think about. Now, these days, if you built a special car like this for dignitaries and officials, it would probably be armored and protected in a bunch of ways. Do you think this car was? I can tell you this car was not armor plated. Uh, I think the 50s was a more innocent time. I think they really weren't expecting anything like that to happen. Um, after Kennedy was assassinated, of course, everything changed. Um, but during the Eisenhower administration, it was, uh, it was literally wide open. Roughly how late were these cars in service? Well, the Los Angeles and New York cars are still in service. Really? They've been continuously used by both of those cities. This car was sold out of Chrysler's uh, collection as a used car, we think during about the 1970s, and is the only one in private hands. How did the uh, Peterson Museum come to acquire this car? Mr. Peterson actually bought this car at an auction. 
Did he want to ride around in it in LA? I don't think he ever rode around in it like you're imagining he would have. <laughs> But he wanted the museum to have a representative example of the kind of car that this is, which is a mid-50s, high-profile presidential vehicle. This is exactly the kind of car that, that Chrysler wanted to be associated with. Well, it's an interesting car, and it really expands the collection in a different way. I mean, we see classics, we see high-performance cars, and modern cars, and old cars, and then this type of special car is just one more facet of the uh, car specialization. Well, you're absolutely right, and we want the collection to represent as many kinds of things uh, as possible. We're standing here next to a couple of Ferraris that really featured in Hollywood. This one's a Daytona that was in a movie called the Gumball Rally, is that right? This is the exact car that Raul Julia drove in the Gumball Rally. This is the car, and I'm paraphrasing, he took out the rear view mirror, threw it away, and said, the first rule of Italian driving is what's behind is not important. Well, the first rule of LA driving is what's behind is very important, so we put the mirror back on, but it's a great story to tell about the car. The Gumball Rally was one of those movies based on a cross-country race, is that right? Yeah, it was based on a cross-country race, and it was the perfect movie for, for that time because it was, uh, it was just a caution to the wind movie. A lot of Americans were feeling really trapped and, and really kind of brought down by the, by the driving situations of the day. And this is a luxurious car driven by a carefree guy in a race that broke all the rules. And a lot of people really could see themselves behind the wheel of this car. I've got to say, for in the interest of historical accuracy, that the Gumball Rally was based on something called the Cannonball Run. That's right. It was actually a genuine event that Car and Driver sponsored. And the first Cannonball Run was pre-run by Brock Yates, Car and Driver editor, and Dan Gurney in a Ferrari Daytona Coupe. And they went cross country, New York to LA in just under 36 hours. And Dan was quoted in the story saying he hit 174 miles an hour in Arizona. Totally true story. So it wasn't all it. Hollywood fantasy. This is a very capable car. I absolutely believe that. Now what year Daytona is this? This is a 1972. They only made them 71, 72. This is a genuine roadster. It's not a cut down car. Because a lot of coupes were converted to roadsters because they're more valuable, and right? That's exactly right. During the 80s, during the 90s, the roadsters just soared in value and a lot of companies transformed the coupes into the roadsters. But this one was delivered as a roadster, delivered new to California. So it's a California spec roadster, the rarest of the rare. Well, and this is what, a 4.4 liter V12 with something like 350 European horsepower. It's just a rocket car, isn't it? I've driven a couple of Daytonas, and as I recall, they didn't have power steering. And uh, once you're up to speed, the steering is pretty nice. In town for parking, it's a pretty good workout in this car. If you're up to driving this car in the city, I think you're up to parking it. Well, this is another iconic Ferrari, the 308, and to a lot of people, this is kind of the classic Ferrari. And which, uh, TV show is this one on? Well, a lot of people look at this car and they think, what is the Peterson Museum doing with this? It's such a common car. I mean, don't the maids drive them in Los Angeles? Uh, the reason we have this car is not only it's a very representative Ferrari of its type, but this was the very car that was driven by Tom Selleck in the Magnum PI series ah. for two shooting seasons. Uh, for only two seasons? Uh, did he switch to some other car? Was it a no, different Ferrari? No, he used different Ferraris. I think he used them up. I, I think that would be a pretty accurate statement. And as I recall, he often drove it with the roof off because he's a pretty big guy and probably doesn't fit in here any other way. Not only did it help him fit in the car, but Hollywood loves convertibles because they can get a better view of the actors in the car. Well, one of the things that always puzzled me in watching that show was this was a pretty hot car for its time, but he often was in chases with hoods and uh, Lincolns and Cadillacs and either had trouble outrunning them or had trouble catching them. Is this kind of a Hollywood plot uh, or, or reality being sacrificed to Hollywood plot? I think the latter is true. I think that they wanted to make it more exciting. They wanted to make the chase a little tighter. So, so I think that's what they did. I think that was all in the direction, not in the performance of the car. Well, also, quite apart from the TV uh, show aspect of this, the 308 was the first uh, eight-cylinder Ferrari, and it was kind of the Ferrari moving into a slightly less expensive price point than this type of car, wasn't it? This particular car did break the Ferrari mold because it used a V8 engine that was uh, mid-mounted. 
It wasn't the front engine, it wasn't the V12 anymore. All of a sudden, Ferrari said, you know what? You know, we can improve performance of our car by just putting the engine in the middle, giving it a better balance. And the earliest versions of these cars had fiberglass bodies, but then they shifted to what, steel or aluminum? Well, the, you're, you're right. The very earliest of these, in fact, the first hundred of these had fiberglass bodies uh, because they didn't have the tooling ready. Cool. Well, this is a car that anyone's going to recognize, and I think the heritage of this really makes it uh, something you want to see. It's an iconic car in every way. This is a 53 Series 62 Cadillac, but it doesn't look like anything that came out of the Clark Street factory in Detroit. Uh, who built this car? Well, this car sure doesn't look like any other Cadillac, but that's the whole idea. In 1953, Cadillac shipped two naked chassis to Ghia in Italy so that they could put custom coachwork on them. Uh, they both were they're very similar. They had detailed trim differences. This one is very, very Italian. It's got the sharp fender crest. It's got the, the sunken headlights. It's got the, the, the interesting little Italian egg crate grill. But it's very, very large by Italian standards. This car, like the, um, like the Corvette Scaglietti, this car was intended to give an American driver uh, an, a motoring experience that they would have been used to but along with it, a lot of Italian flair and a lot of Italian design. So in other words, you had strong, reliable American underpinnings that were very easy to service, cloaked in a very sexy Italian body. There are a lot of little, little Italian styling flourishes, like these five chrome strips on either side, the one chrome strip that starts on the middle of the roof and goes all the way back down the rear window and kind of divides it in two. And we think those are things that the original owner of this car would have especially liked the original owner being Rita Hayworth. This car was bought for her by the Ali Khan, then the world's wealthiest man. So she, like, like Rita needed more attention, but this was a, quite a way to go. Were they a couple at the time or was this his idea of getting her attention? Well, I think, I don't know that they were a couple at this exact time. I know their, their relationship had its ups and downs, but uh, this was certainly a time when they were at least friendly. How long do you think she held on to this car? We're not sure how long she held on to it. We know that it existed in Hollywood for, for a while, and it was originally painted a very light color, we believe it could have even have been white. Um, the other car is, has subtle trim differences that distinguish it. This much darker purplish color seems to suit it very, very well. This deep maroon metallic is correct for the era. It's a very correct color for the early 50s, and it, it seems to suit the contours of the car. It really shows off the, the angles and the and the intersections of planes that, that Ghia was so famous for. It's just like a, it's like a faceted diamond. Well, it's a real standout car, even just lined up with a bunch of others, and you can't really see it from afar. This car just leaps out at you with all of its details. This car is so extraordinary, and it's, it's got such a sculpted feel to it. It just leaps out at you. This is the Mongrel T. And on most of these cars, I know a little something about them, so I can ask a semi-intelligent question. But the only thing I can ask you here is, what the hell is this car, Leslie? <laughs> well, it's a good thing you can't ask an intelligent question, because I'd be hard-pressed to give an intelligent answer. They call this a mongrel T, because like a mongrel dog, it is of uncertain parentage. We really don't know all the components that went into it, but that's, that's the whole idea behind this car, is they built it out of a lot of different things. It uses Cadillac headlights, obviously a Rolls-Royce radiator, and dozens of things that aren't even auto-related. Does the T refer to Model T in some way, shape, or form? The T designates a Model T, like a Ford Model T, but um, anything but. Well, it's not a small block Chevy because no. the uh, distributor's in the front right, and right. it has can, equally spaced headers. Right, we can rule that out. So maybe it's a Ford engine of some sort or something like that. But what I can tell you is this is a modern V8 engine, obviously replacing the original 20 horsepower Ford four-cylinder from the Model T. This car was a movie car. It wasn't built for custom shows or anything like that. It was built by George Barris for the 1966 Elvis Presley movie, Easy Come, Easy Go. And was that a surf movie? Is that why we have these uh, surfer aspects? It, it, it was a, a surfing movie like so many of them were during the 1960s. And that's why you have the surfboards. That's why you have what they call the Icelandic sheepskin. That's why you have a, a lot of other mod-looking uh, details. Now, normally when a 
a weird car like this was built for a movie. What happened when the movie production was done? Did they just break it up or throw it away? Or? Well, no, this car actually stayed intact and it had a second life as the Joker's car on the Batman TV series. So this car is popular in a couple of ways and, and pretty high profile car. I think a lot of people recognize this one. I have no idea what the Joker had to do with all of these disparate parts, but his name was the Joker. So who knows? Well, you mentioned this was a Barris customized car. I think behind us, we have a Ford Mustang. Right. Was this also a Barris customized car? This car is also customized by Barris at almost exactly the same time. And you know, this is a tribute to the genius of George Barris that you can see he could take a fairly stock car and through a couple of really specific modifications, make it look completely different. For example, if you look at the front of this car, it's barely detectable as a 1965 Mustang. It looks like anything but and he chopped the top off into a kind of a targa. He put a television set in the front, which is exactly where you don't want a television set these days. But you know, in, in the day, a TV in your car was a really big deal. Well, I don't know if fur was the thing in the 60s, but it sure was with Barris, uh, because it seems like he used fur a lot. Uh, obviously, on these two cars, because this, this one has the, what they call Icelandic sheepskin, and this one has zebra fur on the side zebra fur on the upholstery inserts, and zebra fur on the roof, believe it or not. <laughs> now, I wouldn't take it through a car wash. Now, where did this car appear? Was this a movie car also? This was a movie car also. It was in the Frank Sinatra movie, Marriage on the Rocks, and it was actually driven by his daughter, Nancy. These booths are made for walking Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was in the movie. They, they were co-stars. This is a 1956 Jaguar XKSS. And I own an E-Type, and I think it's a really voluptuous looking car, but nothing like this. Uh, what was an XKSS? Well, you do see a lot of E-Type in this car, but the XKSS was actually a derivation of the Jaguar D-Type racing car that did so well at Le Mans. When the D-Type was no longer competitive, Jaguar still had quite a few of those laying around, so they said, well, let's turn it into a road car. Let's, let's give it a proper windshield, let's give it side windows, let's give it a top, let's give it some other niceties that you're gonna need out on the road. And they built 16 of them before the fire burned the plant down. Now under the hood, it's still the XK six cylinder engine and what, 3.4 liters in this car? Yes, it's only a slightly detuned uh, Model D engine. It's, it's very fast, it makes all the right noise, it's quick. When you look at these side pipes, I mean, that really looks like a racing derived exhaust system, doesn't it? Well, there's a lot that speaks to racing heritage of this car. It's got the outside latch that holds the hood in place. It's got the riveted bodywork. It's got the outside exhaust. It's, it's every inch of thoroughbred. Who owned this particular car? Well, that's an exciting part. Steve McQueen owned it. He liked it so much, he bought it twice. When McQueen bought it, it was originally white with red interior, but he didn't like that so much. He liked the green color, the British racing green with the black interior. And he had a couple other modifications. He had Tony Nancy, very famous upholsterer, did a lot of racing cars. He had Tony Nancy himself upholster this car. And he had Von Dutch fashion a little glove box lid for the glove box door, so that under heavy acceleration, what was in there wouldn't fall out onto the passenger's lap. Well, you know, it's very funny you mention that because my 65 E-Type doesn't have a glove box door, so I guess that was a refinement that Jaguar was a little slow with. Yeah, apparently, maybe they thought that you really needed access to your gloves in a hurry. <laughs> well, McQueen was not just another Hollywood guy who liked hot cars and had the budget right. for him. He really got into motorcycling and racing, and I understand he finished second in Sebring one year, and he really was the serious, he was a real enthusiast, wasn't he? Well, that's right. More than a sportsman, Steve was a capable driver. He was more capable than just about anybody uh, in, in his day, and certainly any actor in his day. Um, he, used to, he used to love taking this car up on Mulholland and is reported to have gotten so many tickets that he almost lost his license multiple times. Fantastic. I mean, uh, the perfect car for the real enthusiast. We're standing between two Mercedes 600 limos, and the question is, do you want one large on the right, or do you want a jumbo one on the left? And I think this is really the key car. This is a 78 Landolette. What makes this a Landolette, and what makes this one special? Well, a Landolette is a body style, like a town car or convertible. But whereas a town car is open over the driver and closed in the back, a Landolette is open in the back and closed over the driver. Because these cars were mostly used for formal processions 
and, and parades and things like that. So do you have to be a head of state to get a Landelay? I don't know that it was an absolute requirement, but I can't think of anybody that wasn't a head of state that would have any use for one of these. Now, which particular head of state drove this one? Well, this is, this is kind of a sinister car because it was owned and used by Saddam Hussein. And it was driven out of Iraq after he fell by an Iraqi businessman. So really, from 78 until basically 2003 or so, this was a presidential limo in Iraq. This was a presidential limo. We have photographs of Saddam Hussein standing in the back. The, the top of portion over the rear would have been lowered. and He was standing back there waving to the people as he, as he went by. Now, was this car armored or protected in any way, to your knowledge? We have not found any armor plating on this car, which is a little bit bewildering because I would have imagined that a whole lot of people would be mad at Saddam Hussein and want to get at him, but uh, this car doesn't, doesn't have any evidence of plating. I saw some handles in the back that looked like maybe guards sat there on the trunk and held on. Would that be correct? That's exactly right. There was a time when this car had running boards on the side for the Iraqi equivalent of Secret Service and also a platform that stuck out behind the trunk for um, also for the Iraqi equivalent of Secret Service and then handles that they could hang on to in the event that the car needed to take off in a hurry. This 600 was one of the longest lived Mercedes. I think they were introduced in the 60s and probably built in what, till the early 80s or so? Uh, exactly right. This car had a very, very long life, but it was timeless when it, it came out. It had a, a marvelous character to it. It was very imposing, it was large. It was as highly engineered as anything you could get in the day. Well, it had a 6.3 liter V8 at a time when most Mercedes models had six cylinders and even four cylinders. So right. it really wasn't a different league from even the average Mercedes. And not just that, this is an overhead cam V8. I mean, this is something that they didn't have to do, but they did. Well, you're gonna build a special car for heads of state. You bring all your engineering tools and install them. You, you might as well. This is a 1960 Mercedes 300 SL, and it's the second generation 300 SL. As it happens, there's a gullwing next to us. That was the first generation SL. But what are the key differences between that first gen gullwing and the second generation SL? Well, the biggest difference is how the doors open. All of the first generation of gullwings were gullwings. They were coupes that the doors were hinged into the roof and opened upward. All of the second generation 300 SLs were roadsters. Uh, you, like this one, you could get it with a hard top, a removable hard top, or without. They all had the fabric top underneath. And the, the and doors. Are conventional oh, doors. This is a conventional door. The reason that they needed the going doors in, in the early generation 300 SL is because the two frame structure came all the way up to here. And there was no way you would have been able to get inside with a regular door. But they re engineered it slightly for the second generation so that you could. Well, that was partially because that first generation Gullwing was derived from a race car and stiffness was important and getting in and out wasn't so important. Now, that first generation car had a uh, fuel injected three liter six cylinder engine. Right. Was that carried over into this car? Yes, it was. In fact, it's the world's first production car with fuel injection when it came out in 1954. And then this model, the Roadster version, the second generation, came out in early 1957 and lasted until the early 60s. Now this car had a kind of famous owner. Uh, who owned this car? This car is an interesting story. Uh, it was Robert Stack's car. And Robert Stack- From the Untouchables. From the Untouchables. And if you go license plate on this car, it kind of gives it away. Uh, but Desi Arnaz gave this as a gift to Robert Stack on the occasion of his winning the Emmy for the Untouchables. So it's got a great Hollywood connection. And it's not a stock color either. This is a color that Robert Stack himself picked for this car. So did he actually use this car a fair amount? He used this car frequently. He used to drive it around. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Peterson knew him well, and he visited them a lot in this car. So how did the museum end up with uh, this car? Robert Stack wanted us to have it when he was done with it, so he called the Petersons, and, and here we are. Perfect home for it. That's a slightly different take than the first one we did in part one on the cars down here in the vault. But as you can see, we've got cars of every type, every style, and every era. And boy, we've got famous owners of every type and style too, don't we? We sure do. Well, this vault tour is fantastic. If someone wants to get down here and see these cars personally, how do they do that, Leslie? Well, we offer guided vault tours morning and afternoon every day that we're open. I invite people to go on peterson.org for specific information. 
That's it for part two of our vault tour. If you didn't see part one, check it out. We covered about a dozen different important cars in that one. I'm Chubachetta. See you next time.